Hey everyone, Benson here, um, and I'm coming at you from the Greening the Desert site uh, in the Dead Sea Valley in Jordan. Um, so we're just at the end of our four week internship and I posted a few photos on Instagram over the last couple of days and I've had heaps of messages asking kind of what I or we've been up to. So I thought I'd give you a little tour of the site. So to start, um, I'm gonna need some help from friends of mine. So I've got uh, my good friend and a mentor and an awesome person all around, Sam Parker Davies, who's with me. Um, Sam's a, a pioneer wonder kid um, and uh, figured you could kind of give us a little lowdown of where we are and what the site is all about. Yep. Cool. So we're on the lowest point on earth, the lowest point on land, and it just so happens that we're filming this after some rain in the desert. First rain for over a year in this place. So we've been tweaking up some earthworks, so it's been quite a big focus to make sure that we get all the water into this site as possible, so that we can recharge the land with organic material, with organic functions, and with the water that we're getting off the site. With this, we can start to regenerate the earth with simple things, simple thinking. We have a demonstration site behind us. In 10 years, it'll come to look like this in the sea of, have a look around. That rubble that you see, that's how the site started. So, I figure we'll take a little walk through, but first I'll introduce the person behind the camera. This is Joshua Anderson coming out of Florida. He's our tree expert. So let's go for a little walk around the site. So here you can see the diversion ditch that some of the interns have been creating. And I'll hand it over to Sam to talk about it a little bit. Okay, so what we've done is we've noticed that there's sheeting coming off this. It's not, not an exceptional amount of water, but it's a, every drop counts in this situation. Any drop of water that we can get onto the site it counts. So there's already an existing hole up here, the highest point on the highest boundary of the property. So we're channelizing water down here, created that diversion drain to go down into this diversion drain. And what we noticed as well on that berm with rocks, the rocks are there to stop erosion as the water hits that berm. And we've also planted it with leukina and other pioneering species, tree species, so that it can create a biological wall, knitting it together with roots so that we don't lose that to erosion and lose it over time. We can hold it strong. So the rocks there at the moment, rocks also here, to stop the erosive forces of water hitting their soil. Because that's what this is all really about, is trying to cover the soil so that we stop losing it to the water, because that is one of the, if not the biggest, environmental problem we face, is a loss of soil to the water. And here we have Saad coming out of Pakistan. Say hello, Saad. Hello, Saad. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. There's another diversion drain that we put in. So this is collecting the runoff from the road here. Super hard rock surface, so you get lots of runoff. And we're catching it and funneling it into the top of the property. So Benson, you've been chopping this up, hey? Yes. What is it? So we've been chopping this over canopy layer here to allow for some light to come into the berm that Sam was mentioning we planted with some pioneer species such as Lucina. Um, what have I been chopping, Joshua? What do we have here? It's a uh, prosopis. And what's, what is prosopis? It's a spiky legume pioneering species. Very spiky. It's a, it's a hard bastard. You can handle <laughs> crazy situations. <laughs> and it grows abundantly in this area. So wherever you go, you'll find this growing around. And we can see it's got some wild spikes on there. So that's why you call it spiky pioneer species. All right, let's jump in. Do you want to go in and straight or in and drop down left? Yeah, in and straight. We show where the hole comes in. Yeah, cool. All right. What do we have here, Sam? We have a swale. We have a ditch on contour so that water sits. It's like a long pool, a long pool of water. And we then have an overflow over there. Saad actually knows more about this swale than I do because of his proximity to it. <laughs> Saad, how full was this this morning? Um, so last night it was raining and because of all of the uh, diversion drains outside, I don't know if you can see this, but this guy was full and holding water and it all it's all sunk down into the ground. So that's infiltration. That's water infiltration, infiltrating into the ground where it otherwise wouldn't, because it's got that buffer to stop it. Otherwise it's sheet off the land and would lose it. 
we lose that precious resource, very precious here, off somewhere else, we lose our soil with it too. So let's walk the soil line to give you a look at how long these can be very and cool. how much water we're absorbing into the landscape. <laughs> So, what we just walked across was one of the highest boundaries on the property. So this is a long swale that has just been put up to catch as much water as we can to infiltrate down here. So, now's about time to mention, if not a little bit late, that this property is thanks to Jeff Lawton. It's his Greening the Desert project and that's the Permaculture Research Institute. Um, so all of the, um, all of the kind of the idea behind this, the catalyst behind this is, um, is Jeff Lawton. So, shout out Jeff. <laughs> cool, let's jump down. So when Jeff designed the property, about 10 years ago now, he put in three earthback swales in succession down because they had so much stone, stone duck swales. So the stones here lodged in here, they create a, a retaining wall and this used to be mounded up here so that it created a swale here too. The swale would sink down into the ground and any water that started coming out would then come down across the land collecting around the fruit trees, collecting in the biological material that we put around it, creating a sponge of moisture because carbon is your sponge. Now what we've done is we've created a swale where it would seep down and we've got an outlet coming through the earth back wall. So it's kind of like a gabion. It comes down, it fills up this swale and then we have it come down here. It come up here and it spread down through the system this way. And Josh? Would you mind taking us through a little bit about some of the trees we just see in this kind of... So we have a lot of different kinds of citrus in here, which come from Florida. That's a, that's a pretty cool thing for me to see, is citrus grown in a very alkaline, harsh condition. And then we have some pollarded lucana, which a couple weeks ago, this was quite tall. And then there's date palms and olives. And that's a uh, albizia right there. Awesome. And uh, would you mind, just because you're the tree expert of us three, yeah. um, would you mind showing us sort of the difference between um, your kind of pioneer species, like uh, your nitrogen fixes, your legumes, mm -hmm. um, and our regular fruit and production trees, and, and kind of what they contribute to an environment and a project like this? All right, so pioneering species are, like the name implies, the first ones that you want to have in there. They pioneer the space, they are fast carbon pathways, they get carbon into the ground, and then they're also um, nitrogen fixers. And what does that mean? Nitrogen fixation is a symbiotic relationship between mycorrhizal bacteria and the tree itself. Mm -hmm. The tree trades starch or carbohydrates in the form of starch for nitrogen from the bacteria. And when you cut these trees, the, the roots are also pruned. And that when the roots prune, the bacteria die off and they're made bioavailable to the plants directly surrounding the, the tree. So when we're seeing a cut off tree like that, is it dead? No. Awesome. So it's what it's very doing, much alive. it's releasing beneficial um, nitrogen into the uh, space around it, making it available for our production trees like our citrus. So essentially what we're doing is using these to create the perfect conditions for productive trees to grow like this. Um, so these are scattered all around the project. We've got date palms here. This is another, I think it's Albizia, no? That's a Lucina. That's a Lucina. Um, and what you do with the chop, it's called chop and drop. You're putting it down here around the base so that you're creating a uh, humus uh, around the, the base of the tree so that any water that comes in sinks in below that and doesn't evaporate. What we're looking for in a system like this, correct me if I'm wrong, is we're trying to reduce evaporation in such a harsh, harsh climate like this where it's hyper arid and you get less than 100 mil of rain a year. Um, when the rain comes, you want to catch it, you want to sink it, store it and spread it so that it goes into the landscape. Um, when we put up trees like this, it buffers the impact of the rain on the top, it seeps down into the ground and soaks. If there were no trees here, like you saw on the outside of the property, uh, you'd be looking at huge amounts of erosion, your soil washing away, evaporating and nothing going into the soil. So with careful design, when we walk around this property, you can see that you can have an abundant system even in a harsh environment like this. Let's keep walking around. And just to prove it, for citrus in the desert with no fertilizer, 
no chemical fertilizer inputs. That's not bad. <laughs> that's really not bad. So here we have the primary animal system um, on the property and it's the chicken tractor on steroids in Jeff's terminology. So here we have, uh, it's a variation of the Berkeley method. So we're flipping compost downhill to reduce impact on the workers. And we're using all these amazing chickens to flip the compost for us. They're fertilizing it with their manure. And at the end, we get this extremely rich fertilizer to add to this hyper alkaline soil. So Moringa oleifera is an amazing tree, honestly. I'm a huge fan of it. This is one of the most nutrient dense terrestrial foods on the planet. And the whole tree is edible from the bark to the root to the leaves, which the leaves are the most nutrient dense part, to the flowers, which the flowers are very pretty. And a bee on the flower there. And there's a bee right there. And then also one of my favorite parts of it is, these ones are still very small, but the drumsticks. I, I make sambars with them, I, I cook them at least a few times a week back home. Beautiful. And have these uh, traditionally been used as plant medicines? Is that right? From uh, yeah. uh, Aboriginal and First Nation peoples all mm -hmm. throughout the globe. Yeah. So amazing tree to have in your system. We're growing medicine, we're growing food. Incredible. As you can see in that brief tour, um, you can grow abundant food even in harsh landscapes like this with careful design um, and excellent mentoring and excellent friendships and building community. Uh, you can grow abundance. Uh, if you swipe to the next photo, I'll take a, a photo from the top of the project up there so you can have a look at an aerial view of what we've been up to.